The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaki is largely an opinion talk show. All opinions, comments, or statements of fact expressed by Gwilda Wiaki's guests are strictly their own and are not to be construed as those of the Science of Magic or endorsed in any manner by Gwilda Wiaki, Relmar McConnell Media Company, its affiliated networks, stations, or employees. Welcome to the Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, a program dedicated to uncovering the unified nature of reality and humanity's ever-evolving place as truly galactic beings. For more information on the Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, visit us online at www.thescienceofmagic.net. Welcome to the Science of Magic, a place where science and magic come together to transform fact into evolving truth. We're coming to you through the Exxon Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net, and can also be found on our website, www.thescienceofmagic.net. I'm your host, Gwilda Wiecka. This hour, we'll be exploring Can't Find My Way Home. Anyone that's even slightly familiar with the practice knows that shamanism works with the spirit world. But few are aware the so-called spirit world is actually varying degrees of the quantum level, which, by its very nature, is extremely multidimensional. What we perceive there is totally dependent upon which bandwidth the frequency we're focused on and how that frequency is interpreted by the mind. At one bandwidth, we might not be aware anything is amiss. At another, we may experience a demon ready to devour us while at yet another, the same apparition may appear as a pathetic spirit that simply lost its way. If our perception is from a higher, less polarized level, we may become aware of a frequency that's simply out of the natural order and in need of correction. Everything is ultimately expressed as frequency. How we experience it is based upon for our focus and training. Most of us see with the five senses and delineate our reality accordingly. This is much like observing a black and white photo of a blade of grass and believing you understand the entire planet. As of late, there's been much interest in ghosts. Ghosts exist in bandwidths of frequency that are above what most of us perceive as physical reality. However, all ghosts aren't dead, and all dead aren't ghosts. I first became aware of this while teaching a workshop at a retreat on what had been an old Amish farm. Many of my gifted students reported seeing a ghost of a woman on the property. When I approached the spirit and offered to take her home, she was willing enough, but when I tried to cross her over, she informed me she was not dead. I later discovered her husband had sold their farm and they moved elsewhere. She'd loved her old home so much that part of her stayed there, even though the rest of her was alive somewhere else. On the other hand, when my mother died, I helped her cross. I saw her enter the light. Yet, she shows up frequently now in spirit form to help me with my work. Having crossed and dropped her robes, or old patterns and damage, my shamanic teachers would say my mother is now a reliable source of information. I can safely trust her guidance as a helping spirit, because she's neither ghost nor a haunting. But what is she really? A disembodied spirit or a metaphor? Where is she really? In heaven or in my DNA? It all depends on where I'm focused and what bandwidth I'm reading. Ultimately, as we access the higher, less polarized frequency, everything that's ever been or will be is one. It all exists in the same time and place. At times, I could be considered a ghost. As a shamanic practitioner, I'm able to become spirit and bilocate. That's to say, though I'm alive and well in my body, I can move my awareness and a goodly amount of my frequency elsewhere. Because I can bilocate with a fair amount of my frequency on deck in spirit form, I'm also able to make change in the frequencies in the location I travel to. Be it Reiki or shamanism, this is the basis behind long-distance healing. When I travel outside of my body, I have to be mindful of focus as I'm outside of time and space. I may know where I am, but not when. As I perfected the form, there have been numerous reports of my clients being aware in the room when I do long-distance work. One even reported that her three-year-old daughter pointed to me where I stood over my client in spirit, calling me an angel. Now, that's not something I'm often accused of. We all bilocate to one degree or another. I've simply been trained to do it consciously with intent. 
when someone with a fair amount of uh, natural ability thinks of me, I can perceive them in the room with me. As with all spirit work, the key in bilocation is being sure one finds their way home. At least parts of us becomes one of the ghosts we seek. Our guest this hour, Joe Wegent, has been a police officer for 20 years and a financial crimes detective for the last four. He's practiced martial arts since 1987. His Kung Fu Tai Chi teacher taught him Reiki in, 19, in 2009, and Joe started a professional practice that, that year. Joe has, uh, the Reiki practice has awakened Joe's ability to be a psychic medium. And after this commercial break, we will talk to Joe about his new awakened abilities and how he works with spirit that he sees. After this commercial break, I'll introduce Joe, and together we'll discuss energy healing, quantum level, depossession, and crossing the dead. Should be hair-raising, so don't go away. You're listening to The Science of Magic. Prior innovative episodes can always be found on our website, www.thescienceofmagic.net. The scientist and the mystic have been on an age-old, relentless search with one thing in common. They seek truth. Their paths converge in the 40,000-year-old practice of shamanism, an ancient science delving to the quantum level of life, facilitating healing, manifestation, and evolution. I'm Gwilda Wiecka, the founder and director of Path Home Shamanic Arts School, a unique Colorado State-certified occupational school, training shamanic practitioners and teachers. We also provide classes for empowering personal lives through shamanism. Our certification classes are in week-long segments, enabling international participation, and online classes and long-distance shamanic healing sessions are available. Come discover the science of magic in the limitless world of shamanism. www.findyourpathhome.com Welcome back. This is the Science of Magic, dedicated to unification and evolution of consciousness. I'm your host, Gwilda Wiecka. Our guest this hour is Joe Wegent, Reiki practitioner, paranormal investigator, and psychic medium. His website is www.reikichoice.com. Joe, thank you for joining us on the Science of Magic. Thank you for having me back. It's a pleasure to be here. It's so fun to always work together, huh? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah. How do you believe that your study of Reiki, do you say that Reiki or Reiki? Reiki, Reiki, Reiki. Uh, Reiki. <laughs> Reiki. As an array of sunshine and key. Yep. I love that. How do you believe that your study of Reiki helped you access your ability to see, seek and speak with spirit? Actually, it was, um, I call it time in grade. It was just simply that over the, the years of my being in that mode of being connected directly to source energy and being connected to the client that I'm working with and being tuned into that frequency, just like you said in your intro, it's about the frequencies that you're tuned into and how you interpret what those frequencies bring you in your own mind. And it's yeah. just over the, the course of a couple of years of always being in uh, connection with that, that source energy that I started seeing things and I started interpreting things. And whenever I would uh, ask clients afterwards, hey, did this happen or did you feel this or, or, you know, these kinds of things, I got validation from what I was actually being shown. And so by learning that I can tune into that, I began to practice that more and more. And now I can do that and, and accomplish uh, greater things and help more people. Got it. So when, you, when you're working and working long distance, like we were talking about, do you pull, it's, it's all semantics, I know, but do you tend to go where your client is or do you work surrogate within where you are? Actually, um, I've done it both ways. Um, I had a client that called me some time ago uh, from Indianapolis, and I'm in Evansville, so it's about a, oh, at least a three-hour drive. Uh, and he called up, I've, I've worked with him before when he's come down to Evansville, and he said that he was having a uh, very serious uh, acute illness going on, and his left leg was swelling up with fluids. He was having a localized edema, and he could not get it to go down. <clears throat> so 
I, you know, took note of all of his symptoms and what was going on, and I said, okay, I, you know, go sit down for a little while, go hang up the phone, don't think about anything. I'm going to be working on you from here. So we hung up the phone, and I began working, and um, a largely I was sending energy to that location from the source, but as I was drawing that energy to me, I was sending it from me to him as well. So it created a, a, a double whammy of energy at his, at his location. And at one point, uh, not only was I sending energy and imagining and creating and manipulating the energy and what it was doing there, I actually, like what you said in your intro, I bilocated to that place and began working on his leg. And whenever the hour was over with, I, I texted him back and I said, okay, I'm finished from this end. You can go take a nap and, and you know, drink a lot of water. And, and he said it was already starting to alleviate by the end of the hour. And by that evening, he had almost uh, completely gone back to normal. By the next morning, it was done. It's amazing what we can do at a distance if we are disciplined enough to take enough of us along, isn't it? Absolutely. You know, and the thing is, so many people believe that it can't happen or that that's impossible to do. But it's it's the way that we're made because everything is, is a an expression of vibrate, uh, vibration of a frequency of energy. Even the chair that you're sitting on or even the clothes that you're wearing, even though they, they feel solid, when you pinch your hand, it feels solid. But it's merely a collection of tiny little bitty particles that are so small they don't weigh anything, they don't have any properties of their own, and yet they're vibrating at a frequency that we in our minds establish as solid. So it's not a stretch at all to believe that you can just tune in like a radio. You can tune in from one frequency to the next to the next. And so if you have a desire to speak with... Uh, those people who have passed on and crossed over, you tune into that channel and you can speak and connect and communicate with those people. If you want to create a healing energy or you want to create a healing effect, you tune into that energy, you tune into that frequency and allow that to flow through and create those effects. You know, what I find interesting is that, you know, there's a lot of people that are naturally gifted. They call themselves psychics or this or that. And I'm not saying that they aren't gifted, but they aren't trained. And so they kind of randomly tune into different frequencies and interpret them literally and jump to take giant leaps, leaps of illogic and go into polarization and fear about the spirits they say they see there. Would you mind speaking to this? Absolutely. I deal with a number of people in my Reiki practice that are suffering from anxiety, which then results in depression. Uh, they often have panic attacks. They often feel confusion. Uh, and when they try to explain some of these things to people, um, their friends don't believe them. Uh, they don't even know how to interpret what they're collecting. Uh, they walk into a room and they're completely bombarded by so many different energies from all the people in the room, plus the room itself, plus whatever else may be in the room, you know, spiritually speaking. And so what this does is because the, the brain, the conscious part of our mind, isn't accustomed to uh, collating and correlating all of that information all at once, it tends to create a lot of confusion and anxiety. So then what happens, and this is even worse, when these people go to speak to a psychologist or some other medical profession about these particular incidences, they get put on medications that dull that uh, sensory input and or affect the mind's uh, method of translation, which often exacerbates the problem. So what I try to do whenever uh, I'm working with clients experiencing these things is to explain to them, okay, you are now a radio that instead of tuning in to one channel, you're getting news, talk, weather, sports, and country all at the same time. It's no wonder that you're going out of your mind. You have to focus on one channel. You have to focus on one radio station. You can't listen to all those things at once. And so whenever people learn to tune into one channel, and tune into something that they actually really want to receive and blot out all the other things from uh, coming in, their focus improves, their skills improve, and their levels of anxiety and depression decrease. 
that's such a great point because so many people that are diagnosed as schizophrenic um, are actually simply gifted that don't know how to manage their gift. And then when you put them on drugs, that makes it even harder to manage. Is that what you're seeing? Yeah. Absolutely. And just like you said, it's not that most people don't have the skills or, you know, quote, quote, gifts. They're just not trained and they're brought up their whole lives to believe that that's all hocus pocus, it's all a bunch of hokum, that that doesn't exist, or, you know, even worse, you're going to hell if you think that way, or, you know, any other number of detraining type scenarios where people say, well, I I know that I'm experiencing this, but I've been told I'm not supposed to be, and so now it's scaring me. And then to make that even worse, whenever you tune into some of the paranormal shows on TV, they come at their investigations with the mindset that anything non-physical has to be demonic. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, if it's not a chair or a table or a person in the room with me, it has to be some dark demon wanting to kill me. And that's <laughs> usually never the case. It's usually Aunt Tilly or Uncle Ned that are in the room <laughs> trying to say hello because they got something important to say. And so, you know, these shows oftentimes make the problems worse instead of better because they're coming at it from a very limited viewpoint. Got it. So, Joey, how how do you personally perceive spirits? Do you actually see them in the room or in your mind's eye or in, in the landscape of your imagination? Um, the answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is yes, because it's all the same. Uh, you know, my imagination is my mind's eye, just like all of us. And whenever we subconsciously sense disruptions in the normal fabric of our experience of this world, how we interpret those disruptions is very important. So if I walk into a room and I notice that there's an energetic disruption in that room and I try to focus in on that energy, it will either appear to me as, you know, a a spiritual guide, an angel, or a deceased loved one, uh, or a guide for somebody else in the room, whatever it may be, because now I'm focused in on what I picked up as a disruption. Uh, Some people who just simply haven't been trained will either A, not notice the disruption, or if they notice it, they don't know how to interpret what they're seeing because they just haven't been taught how to focus in on one particular frequency. Got it. So, So they get confused, and then they take it and run, yes? Absolutely. Absolutely. Amazing. Amazing. So would you tell us the difference between, um, you know, we, we were talking about uh, spirits, like of, of people that have crossed, but then you also mentioned helping spirits and guides. How can you tell the difference? Uh, the way that I interpret information, and this is me personally, a lot of other people may also be doing this, but this is the way I do this. If I'm noticing something in the room or if I'm doing a tarot reading or I'm, I'm uh, doing Reiki and I notice something extra has come into room with us, I will normally just ask the questions, you know, what is this? What is going on with this? Is this the case of in this particular scenario, whatever? And if I feel a good feeling about the response, then I know that I'm on track. If I'm not feeling good about the response or I'm not feeling as though my question came up with the, the answer that's making me feel good, then I go on to the next question. Um, actually, I had a, um, I was in a tarot reading class several years ago, and one of the girls in the class had a full-fledged high-speed panic attack right there at the table with us. Oh, my goodness. And Yeah, she was, I mean, crying and hyperventilating and just really having a horrible emotional time right there in the class. And the the fellow teaching the class, uh, he was a friend of mine, and we're both looking back at each other, and we could both see behind her a her spirit guide that was trying to connect. And subconsciously, she could tell something was there, but it frightened her to the point that she was panicking about what it was. And we're both trying to encourage her that this is your guide, this is for you, you just need to simply relax and let him speak he's got things to say and it took us about 20 minutes to get her a to calm down and then get her to finally tune in and focus in on what was actually there for her to begin with but the both of us could see this in in the room and it was standing behind her she's like i know that it's there i just don't know what to do about it (laughs) so (laughs) we literally had to you know just 
sit down with her and just walk her through this process. And once she got to that point where she could accept that this was a spirit guide, this was a helping spirit, then she began to connect with this in a way that she was able to, you know, make leaps and bounds in her spiritual life and in her her, uh, psychic life and, and be able to better understand things that were going on around her. So, yeah, those things really do happen. People subconsciously pick up on things that their conscious mind can't process yet, and it creates a great deal of confusion. Yeah, confusion and angst and how lucky you were there. You know, we're going to have to take a little break here, Joe, Um, but we'll take up with this on the other side because it's pretty fascinating. Joe and I will return to our discussion after this short break. You're listening to The Science of Magic at the Exxon Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. I'm your host, Golda Wiecka. Previous broadcasts of thought-provoking episodes can always be found on our website, www.thescienceofmagic.net. We will be back, so don't you go away. The scientist and the mystic have been on an age-old, relentless search with one thing in common. They seek truth. Their paths converge in the 40,000-year-old practice of shamanism, an ancient science delving to the quantum level of life, facilitating healing, manifestation, and evolution. I'm Gwilda Wiecka, the founder and director of Path Home Shamanic Arts School, a unique Colorado State certified occupational school, training shamanic practitioners and teachers. We also provide classes for empowering personal lives through shamanism. Our certification classes are in week-long segments, enabling international participation, and online classes and long-distance shamanic healing sessions are available. Come discover the science of magic in the limitless world of shamanism. www.findyourpathhome.com Welcome back. This is the Science of Magic, a place where magic and science come together to promote enlightenment. I'm your host, Gwilda Wiecka. Our guest this hour is Joe Wiegent. Joe, we were just started, starting to talk about how many of us are approached by spirits that are here to help us, but it just freaks us out, and how unusual it is that someone's there that can also see and talk us through it. Um, what, what advice do you have for people that feel that something's kind of stalking them, uh, but they don't know what it is? Uh, I think there's a basic understanding of the way that the mind works is really paramount here. The subconscious mind is kind of like the part of the iceberg that's underwater, and our conscious mind is that little bitty part that we see above the water's surface. Our subconscious mind, whether we're awake or asleep, is always processing all the frequencies of the universe, and it's cataloging it, and it's correlating it, and it's uh, discerning what it is. And when it finally sees something that's important for us to know about, it will put that information up toward the conscious mind where we can process that in a waking state and uh, deal with that in this world. So whenever people are noticing that there's something in the room with them or that there's the energy is not right in a place or they just don't feel right in the, in the basement or they just feel like, like what you said, there's something stalking them, what that is is that is their subconscious mind has processed this information and now has sent this information to the conscious mind to be further processed and to be acted upon. So what I try to do with people who are experiencing these kinds of things is to and teach them about how the mind itself works, and then teach them how to focus in on those frequencies that the subconscious mind is alerting us to, to be able to better understand what it is that is near us or approaching us or around us. Um, actually, tonight I have, a, uh, I have a job to do that is a, exactly along these lines. I got a call from a friend who says that uh, she has a friend of hers who feels that he is 
being possessed or invaded or taken over by something very dark and scary, and he is very frightened. Uh, she says that she has seen something change in him and is seeing something that is not right about him as far as his energy is concerned. And, you know, of course, she's tried to smudge his apartment, but that's not enough sometimes. You have to go in there and deal with the problem before you can clean the problem. And so <laughs> that's what I'm going to do this evening is to go over there and take a look at this particular fella, to talk him through some of the things that are happening, take an assessment of what may or may not be either in, around, or about him, and take appropriate action and then, you know, energetically clean the place before I leave. Wow, that's that's a beautiful service. And and the the what I'm impressed with here, Joe, is the way that you're able to counsel people as to how what they're picking up is not necessarily uh, a bad thing. It's just being interpreted in a way that's scaring them. Absolutely. It's always the unknown that is frightening. But once you've been introduced to that unknown and you understand it, then that unknown no longer is fearful and it's no longer... Uh, something that, that we feel is attacking us. And sometimes it's, you know, just you know, like we were talking about earlier, it could be a past loved one, it could be a spirit guide, it could be a number of different things. But until we know, we're going to be afraid of it. And unfortunately, in our, in our society that we live in now, we are being taught that if it's not physical, it has to be something evil. And right. it's, there, it's so, so few times where that's the case. Exactly. You know, the other thing that I notice an awful lot, and it's just because of the way I'm wired, I'm sure, but people that are alive, if they bring me to mind or if they're fairly gifted when they're thinking about me or concerned for me or whatever, I can literally feel them in the room. And it's almost like I feel their face superimposed over my own, and that's how I can tell who they are. Have you had that experience, and can you speak to it? I have not had that experience. Um, I have done uh, quite a bit of distance work. Um, Matter of fact, just a a few months ago, we had a a friend of mine who's going to go with me on this job tonight alerted me to a friend of his in Tennessee who was, uh, he had been on some really hard drugs for a while, and he felt that there was something in the house that was not really supposed to be there, and he really thought that this was going to be something of an ill intent. So the two of us remotely went to that place, just like you were talking about in your intro. I'm fully alive in my room, but yet my spirit and my consciousness has now gone to a different location. And, you know, my friend came to my house, and we sat in the living room and both went into, uh, you know, a, a light trance state, and both of us bilocated to that location. And there was something in the house that didn't belong there. And we uh, we dispatched that with authority and cleaned up the place energetically and went back to my house. And what was really amazing about that entire episode was uh, that evening, everybody in the house had said that there was definitely a very positive change in that location and that the house did feel better. And everyone uh, was able to live a little bit more peaceably. And they just felt much, much uh, lighter and cleaner in the house than they ever had before. Do you think that when people are doing heavy drugs that they open gateways for things to slide in? Well, I equate it to this. If if you are a, a cheetah or a lion on the Serengeti and you're, you're hungry and you want to eat, you're not going to go after the fastest impala or the, the quickest gazelle. You're going to look for the slower, the weaker, the old, the sick. And so whenever the herd travels by, you're not going to go out and try to catch the fastest one in the herd. You're going to hang back and wait until the slow ones come loping by, and those are going to be the ones that you attack. And when things come into our dimension from other areas of the universe and they, they tear a hole into the fabric of our time and space, They also tend not to look for the brightest stars to try to go house themselves into. They're going to look for the ones that are already compromised in some way, the drug addicts, the alcoholics, those who already have uh, mental or emotional discapabilities or or disabilities. And so they're going to set up shop in those people because it's just easier to move into. You're not going to go and try to find the the nearest uh, preacher or Catholic priest to go set up shop in if you're something that's dark or sinister or or something that's just, you know, needing emotional energy to survive because there's just too much light in there. 
So I think those people who are doing drugs uh, open themselves up to becoming victims, but I don't think that they're intentionally or even uh, unintentionally calling things into them. I just think that they're the slowest gazelles in the pack. <laughs> That's really well put. <laughs> well, let, I hope I stay a young gazelle for a long time, right? <laughs> I mean, yeah, so do I. I. I hope that my bulb never burns out. I don't want to be the, the slow gazelle. <laughs> That's, that could be a really, what's really, really bad thing. What's really tragic, however, is that some of these people who are doing drugs are experiencing the kinds of things that we're talking about on this show, that their their subconscious mind is picking up on things, their conscious mind hasn't been able to interpret it, they don't understand what is happening in the room around them, uh, sometimes they're being contacted and they just don't know what to do with the information, and they they use drugs to suppress those things so they don't have to be afraid of them anymore, which then makes them the slowest gazelle in the pack, leaving them open to attack by things that might not have the best intentions in mind. So it's a, it's a really horrible uh, spiral, a uh, uh, cycle of destruction. Yeah, a vicious circle, absolutely. Sure explains bad acid trips, doesn't it? Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> you know, another thing that I've noticed uh, when working in spirit, and this is something that I wrestle with a bit, is um, when you're going from one place to the other, you can start to slipstream in time. And it's been pretty amazing to me how, um, you know, time is so fluid. Can you speak to that? You know, I read a wonderful uh, interpretation of the fluidity of time, that, you know, time and matter are constructs of our collective consciousness. And the greatest way, and I, I don't remember the author of this, this book or this article that I read, but they said if you don't think time stands still for a little bit, sit on the couch and close your eyes. And keep them closed for about 30 seconds. And then open your eyes and look at the nearest clock. And if it has a minute hand moving, or if it's a digital and it's counting the seconds by, look at it. And you'll notice that that minute hand or that second hand will stay still for like three or four seconds of time before it finally starts ticking again. Or if it's a digital clock, it might be on 13 seconds but it'll stay there for what your mind perceives to be three, four, or five seconds, and then all of a sudden it'll be 14 seconds, 15 seconds. So our minds collectively have created time. Um, actually, I, I read an article just uh, last year that quantum physicists have actually frozen light. They've held light still for uh, a fraction of a second, and they did this by, you know, creating two panels that they passed light through that had different properties, and light literally stopped for a fraction of a second before it traveled on. So Good heavens. this quantum universe that we live in is a projection of our collective consciousness, and you know, we are the ones who dictate the rules of what happens here. Time is a, is a fluid uh, relative uh, item that we have uh, all agreed to choose to live by. It's just a, a, a measurement of relativity, actually, isn't it? Like where the planets are in relationship to each other. Isn't that the purest uh, definition of time? Absolutely. And, well, whenever you're talking about planets moving among one another, time is simply a matter of relative distance and speed. Exactly. And if all the planets stood still, there would be no time because... <laughs> Their time is only measured as a relative distance and a relative motion and a direction of motion. It's the vector of the planet's motion that creates that time. And that's why um, uh, quantum physicists talk about uh, when you get close to a black hole, time changes. You age at a different rate. Time goes different on the planet than it does outer space close to the black hole. Have you looked at that at all? Um, I have not, but I can agree that... Um, you know, black holes are a, a function of gravity, that, that gravity becomes so strong because of mass being so heavy at that one location that even light cannot escape that gravitational field. But gravity is so confusing that amongst the four physical forces that we know of, no one, you know, when... Einstein created his papers in 1905. No one since then has been able to correlate gravity within the other three forces. 
which is why we have the Hadron Collider, which is why we have all these experiments with the double slit experiment and uh, quantum entanglement and all these other things, because we're trying to figure out how does gravity work, because gravity is also a construct. An atom by itself is made up of little bitty tiny little particles that really don't weigh anything, and they're being held together only by pure 100% energy. But if you put enough of them together, suddenly your chair becomes hard to pick up. Yeah, they get mass. Mass has gravity, and there we have it. There we are. And somehow (laughs) each year my gravity seems to pull harder on me. And I think it's just a function of, you know, gravity as more (laughs) than my weight, actually. I absolutely hear you there. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it, too. (laughs) Hey, that's why. It's not because I eat too much. It's because gravity pulls harder on me than you. (laughs) We're going to have to take a a break, Joe. (laughs) Uh, We'll get get back on this one on the other side. Joe and I will be back on the flip side of this commercial break. You're listening to The Science and Magic on the Exxon Broadcast Network, the place where altruistic professionals of science and the esoteric create common ground for the betterment of our world. You can always listen to our previous transformative broadcasts on our website, www.thescienceofmagic.net. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, www.xzen.net. The scientist and the mystic have been on an age-old, relentless search with one thing in common. They seek truth. Their paths converge in the 40,000-year-old practice of shamanism, an ancient science delving to the quantum level of life, facilitating healing, manifestation, and evolution. I'm Gwilda Wiecka, the founder and director of Path Home Shamanic Arts School, a unique Colorado State Certified Occupational School, training shamanic practitioners and teachers. We also provide classes for empowering personal lives through shamanism. Our certification classes are in week-long segments, enabling international participation, and online classes and long-distance shamanic healing sessions are available. Come discover the science of magic in the limitless world of shamanism. www.findyourpathhome.com Welcome back. This is the Science of Magic, bringing together gifted people of service to the world. I'm your host, Gwilda Wiecka. I guess our guest this hour is Joy Wegent. Joy, thanks again for being on the show. And I'd like to move into talking about gooks, ghosts, and goblins and things that go bump. Would you mind describing how you can tell if a ghost needs to be helped crossing over? Absolutely. Um... Well, there are four things that will possibly happen inside a house when people are experiencing some strange phenomena. Uh, The first is a residual energy. This is a recorded incident that happens inside of a structure, uh, whether it's uh, a person who lived there for a very, very long time, and whenever they go, another person moves into the house, and they can still see that person in the home. That may not be an intelligent moving ghost inside the place, but it's a recorded piece of ener- energy that is now in the building. You'll yes, I, ca- I call those traces, and they, they're really different, aren't they? They are different because they, they cannot be communicated with. They're just exactly. simply a recording. Mm-hmm. And you can get these kind of things uh, picked up in churches, funeral homes, uh, hospitals, and things like that. There's so much of the same kind of energy in a church or a, a funeral home that when you walk in, you feel that energy. But whenever you're going into a home that's experiencing some things and they say, well, I'm seeing this same old lady walking, you know, down the hall every day. Well, that's because she lived there for 70 years and, well, her energy is now imprinted on that house. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. The second is um, what I call visitors. These are people who have, uh, they've passed on, they've dropped their mortal coil, and they crossed into the light, and they are allowed to come back and visit this plane of existence because we're only a few frequencies away from each other, and they walk among us all the time. And sometimes those who are close to us have things that they want to say or they want to leave behind some messages, and so they will be in the space, and their presence can be known and felt. 
The third kind um, I call uh, trapped ones. Uh, these are the people who have uh, laid down their mortal coil, but they never went into the light. And there's about a dozen reasons why some people don't go into the light. Sometimes it's because of anger. Sometimes it's because of attachment. Sometimes it's fear of judgment. Sometimes it's unfinished business. But for whatever reason known to them, they decided not to go into the light and onto the next phase of existence. And so they become trapped in between worlds. They're no longer physical, but they're not where they're supposed to be. They're in between phase. They're in between two different radio stations, and they're basically static. Now, these are the kinds of things that cause problems in homes because for them, you know, our construct of time has literally stopped for them. Mm -hmm. They'll still be in the same period clothes that they left the earth in. But now they are insanely either jealous, angry, or upset, or whatever, at those who are still living here. And so whenever you have someone who moves into a house that was you know, built several decades ago, and they start tearing out walls or painting things, they start stirring up all this energy because now this person who is attached to the house is lashing out. Mm -hmm. So um, when I go into a home, I have to figure out which of these things is happening. And how I do that is I, I walk in and I, I sense the energy, and each one of them has a, uh, almost like a different frequency or a different radio station. And depending on if they are an intelligent uh, energy source where they can actually communicate back, then I, that's when I start determining, okay, are you here because you're leaving a message or are you here because of another purpose? Um, I recently did a house down in Henderson where there was an old man who was a drunk and he was an abusive person, and everybody around him felt his wrath. He was an angry, drunk, belligerent, mean cuss of an old man. And when he went, he felt so much attachment to this place that he refused to go into the light. And more people kept moving into and out of the house until finally the people who live there now called me and said, we have an issue, and I think you're the person to come fix it. Well, I had to go into trance state and try to convince this angry old man to go into the light, and it took quite a bit of psychology to convince him that that's where he needs to be and where he is now is not where he needs to be. And so it took quite a while and quite a bit of energy to convince him that that is the natural progression of things. This is where he is supposed to go, and that is where his next duties are to perform. And he finally went into the light. And as soon as he did, the homeowner sitting next to me on, on the couch said, oh, my goodness, the room just changed. And I said, yeah, because this angry old guy isn't here anymore. He went into the light now. And, you know, I'm exhausted. I want a pizza. So... um. They said immediately afterwards that the house felt completely different. Um, the, the people who were there to visit were able to visit more frequently and because they had purpose. And the other spirits who were in and about the house were no longer fearful of this angry old spirit that was causing some problems. And it also allowed the people living there, the living people, to have a more enjoyable time in the space. That's amazing. It's it's you know when you an when you anchor anger, <laughs> regardless of whether we're alive anchoring it or dead anchoring it, it drops the frequency and it, it pollutes everything, doesn't it? Hey, Absolutely. Joy, before before we run out of time, would you mind telling people what services you offer and where they can find you? I can be found anywhere in the Evansville area. I can do these things by remote. Um, I'm in the Evansville area. The services I provide are. Uh, Reiki services. I do energy healing uh, on those people who uh, have physical or emotional uh, disruptions or ailments. I also uh, do tarot card readings where we can discuss issues that are going on in your life and we can use the pictures to uh, help determine the, the challenges and the obstacles and consequences that are surrounding this particular issue. I also do spiritual work where I can come into a home or a place of business or any other uh, site and do a site reading on the home and determine what is actually occurring into the, into the house and then deal with those things in an appropriate manner that creates peace for the living and for those who have crossed. Oh, what a beautiful service. And, and they get a hold of you on your website, is that correct? 
They can get a hold of me on the website. I am also on Facebook, and that is the easiest and fastest way to get a hold of me is um, by my name, Joe Weijin, on Facebook, or by the Reiki Choice on Facebook, or um, my other service is called Epic Evansville Paranormal Investigations and Consulting, and they can reach me through there. And Fantastic. I've, I've always got my phone on me, and I'm always willing, willing to uh, listen to messages, and I'm here to help. Fantastic, Joe. I'm glad you're here to help because Lord knows we need it right now. So how do you protect yourself when you're doing this work, Joe? Do you work with spirit helpers? I actually, when I started doing some of these things, um, I was working with a a lady that came in. She had been uh, sober for several years, and she was now a sponsor in her local AA group. And I started uh, working uh, Reiki on her. In the first session, uh, there was a lot of black nasty energy around her heart and when I started pulling some of this out of her heart I noticed that I pulled what looked like a a small ghost or a squid out and it screamed all the way into the floor (laughs) now what what bothered me about that incident is that I was not bothered about that incident (laughs) I, I, I watched this happen and I'm going I know this really happened I know I saw this going on and I just kept on working it didn't bother me so I you know I got home later and I consulted some people that I know and my my teacher said well welcome to the club this is what you're going to be doing for a while (laughs) and so I started pulling more and more dark nasty things out of people and then I noticed that the bigger they were the more time that they'd had inside of someone they started actually fighting back so after one of them had uh, attacked me back and wrapped itself around my hand as I was trying to remove him, I called on the Archangel Michael. Got to love that guy with the sword. Oh, I'm t- oh, that's exactly what he did. He came in with the sword, swooped in over my shoulder, and commenced to immediately dispatching this thing. Well, if anyone who's ever dealt with him, the man is a taskmaster. He, <laughs> he stands next to me and crosses his arms over his chest, and he says, you know this is your job, right? And I said, yeah, but I don't have the skills you have. And to which he replied, well, yeah, you do. And we went into a, a long conversation, the two of us, over the course of several of these kinds of incidents, which began to get stronger and stronger and stronger. And I asked Michael one day, I said, okay, um, Some of these things have the tendency to kind of hang on and follow you home, and I really don't kind of, I don't need that in my life. (laughs) And Michael, he looked at me and he said, look, we can't, you know, me, us, and my, my helpers, we can't sit from where we are and just clean the world of this stuff instantly. We need people to people contact. We need Mm. people to help other people individually. And that's where you come in. We will bring people to you, you know, by whatever means necessary that need these kinds of services done. We will offer you the opportunities to exercise these gifts and these skills. But as long as you avail yourself to this particular task, I assure you with my solemn promise, nothing will ever harm you. Mm. And, you know, whenever you're having a conversation with the Archangel Michael and you get a promise as strong as that, you know, that, yeah, well, immediately I started crying and, and it was a it was an emotional time. And from that moment on, I I walk into some of these scenarios with, A, you absolute know, authority, courage, confidence, and I know that nothing's going to And you know you're covered. <laughs> and, you know, and time, flies and, time flies and we're out of it, Joe. Thank you so much for being with us. Our guest this hour is Joe Wegent, Reiki practitioner, paranormal investigator, and psychic medium. His website, www.reikichoice.com. You've been listening to The Science of Magic. Remember, you can always listen to past thought-provoking episodes on our website, www.thescienceofmagic.net. Until next time, dear ones, may you be blessed with knowledge, comforted with love, as you explore the multidimensional land of spirit. Won't be for one nation